Hello and welcome to Money Trail with me, Amir Arafat. Today, the International Banking Cartel, Part 3. But first, a quick check of Part 2. By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few private bank systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking corporate worlds were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, and the Rothschilds. In the early 1900s, they sought again to publish legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and the public were wary of such institutions, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. In 1907, J.P. Morgan published rumors that the Knickerbocker Trust Company was insolvent. This was a deliberate act of market manipulation which precipitated the panic of 1907. This led to an eruption of bankruptcies, repossessions, and failures. Unaware of the fraud, the panic led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich. Aldrich had intimate ties to the banking cartels, and he was the insider the banking cartels desperately needed. The commission led by Aldrich recommended a central bank should be implemented so the panic of 1907 would never happen again. This was the jumpstart the international bankers needed. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at the J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill, called the Federal Reserve Act, was drafted. The bill was written by bankers for bankers. The meeting was held in complete secrecy. After the bill was constructed, it was then handed to their political spokesperson, Senator Nelson Aldrich, and he pushed it through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, while the majority of Congress was away for the holidays, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in and President Wilson signed it into law. Starting with 1913 and the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, we have privately owned central banks whose sole mission is to disguise themselves as operating in the public interest, when in fact they operate strictly in the interest of the member banks, the member private commercial banks. So we have this uh, giant veneer of a deception going on, and that is the main problem. The Federal Reserve is bad uh, because of what it does, but what it does is influenced by the fact that it's privately owned. It needs to be nationalized. The central bank is an institution that produces a currency for an entire country. Two powers are inherent in central banking practices. Number one, they control the interest rates, and number two, they control the money supply and inflation. The central bank does not print the money supply and hand it over to the country. Instead, the central bank prints the money and loans it to the country at interest. Then through increasing and decreasing the money supply, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the long-term product of the central banking system is debt. We don't print money here in this country. We borrow every penny of it, with the exception of coin money, which is a very small percentage. The problem is that we are we're, the national debt, which is our national money, every bit of it is borrowed uh, into existence primarily from commercial banks. Well, the debt that the government are taking on right now, we need to stop pretending that it's ever going to be repaid. Uh, the American people need to uh, perhaps take to the streets uh, chanting no more national debt. Since September 17, 2011, thousands and thousands of Americans have been on the streets across our country blaming the big banks for the so-called Great Recession that officially started back in 2007. Blaming the top banks for the joblessness, homelessness and poverty that has gripped the nation. This march is about the banks and what they've done to the American economy. They crashed the economy with terrible investments, with speculation that really does not do anything but make them rich and make us poor. 
and we're protesting that. We want them to be held account uh, accountable. We want them to pay for the damage they did. Fraud should be punished by jail terms. The, the banks are responsible for the depression in two senses, right? The, the, this banking cartel deal in derivatives once again. Options, futures, indices, collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, two trillion, I'm sorry, two quadrillion of derivatives in notional value in the world, and the turnover, the buying and selling of those derivatives up to five, six, seven quadrillion, thousand trillion dollars. What happened in 2007 is the lead up to that is they found new financial innovation in order to find new markets for debt. And this came um, in the form of subprime borrowers looking to uh, get on the property ladder. And so really 2007 and what's occurred since has just been perpetuating a broken system, um, which really the, the institution that's benefited pr primarily from that is anyone that's involved in banking. The banks that are in danger are the five big banks that have made huge derivative gambles. 80% of the derivatives are done by the five largest banks. And they are, they've made a, a big gamble that stock markets and uh, real estate uh, prices are going to go up. What's the, the gross domestic product of the world? It's about 70 trillion, so two quadrillion of derivatives and 70 trillion of, of production. And even some of that is, is hot air in, as well. This is impossible. So the banks have created the derivatives. The reason this crisis is so much worse than previous ones is the presence of derivatives. After the Great Depression, the United States had 40 years of economic growth without a single financial crisis. The financial industry was tightly regulated. Most regular banks were local businesses, and they were prohibited from speculating with depositors' savings. Investment banks, which handled stock and bond trading, were small private partnerships. In the traditional uh, investment banking partnership model, the partners put the money up. And obviously, the partners watched that money very carefully. In December of 2000, Congress passed the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. Written with the help of financial industry lobbyists, it banned the regulation of derivatives. Once that was done, it was off to the races. And the use of derivatives and financial innovation uh, exploded dramatically after 2000. So help me God. So help me God. By the time George W. Bush took office in 2001, the U.S. financial sector was vastly more profitable, concentrated, and powerful than ever before. Dominating this industry were five investment banks, two financial conglomerates, three securities insurance companies, and three rating agencies. And linking them all together was the securitization food chain, a new system which connected trillions of dollars in mortgages and other loans with investors all over the world. 30 years ago, if you went to get a loan for a home, the person lending you the money expected you to pay him or her back. You got a loan from a lender who wanted you to pay him back. We've since developed securitization, whereby the people who make the loan are no longer at risk if there's a failure to repay. In the old system, when a homeowner paid their mortgage every month, the money went to their local lender. And since mortgages took decades to repay, lenders were careful. In the new system, lenders sold the mortgages to investment banks. The investment banks combined thousands of mortgages and other loans, including car loans, student loans, and credit card debt, to create complex derivatives called collateralized debt obligations, or CDOs. The investment banks then sold the CDOs to investors. Now when homeowners paid their mortgages, the money went to investors all over the world. The investment banks paid rating agencies to evaluate the CDOs, and many of them were given a triple A rating, which is the highest possible investment grade. This made CDOs popular with retirement funds, which could only purchase highly rated securities. This system was a ticking time bomb. Lenders didn't care anymore about whether a borrower could repay, so they started making riskier loans. The investment banks didn't care either. The more CDOs they sold, the higher their profits. And the rating agencies, which were paid by the investment banks, 
had no liability if their ratings of CDOs proved wrong. You weren't going to be on the hook, and there weren't regulatory constraints. Um, so it was a green light to just pump out more and more and more loans. Between 2000 and 2003, the number of mortgage loans made each year nearly quadrupled. Everybody in this uh, securitization food chain from the very beginning until the end, they didn't care about the quality of the mortgage. They were caring about maximizing the volume and getting a fee out of it. In the early 2000s, there was a huge increase in the riskiest loans, called subprime. But when thousands of subprime loans were combined to create CDOs, many of them still received AAA ratings. Uh, we've been continuing to perpetuate um, and prop up a, a broken system which is at the end of its time. Um, but in 2007, the catalyst was really just decades and decades of build-up of a system where debt is perpetually increasing and banks receive a kick um, and a commission out of every transaction that puts people, companies, and governments further into debt. What we're now left with is the zombie banks. Now, this term comes out of Japan in the 1990s, but a zombie bank is an institution that has no positive role whatsoever. Zero positive role. It, they do not invest. They do not put money into plant and equipment and the creation of productive jobs. They don't do commercial banking. They don't do trade financing. They don't do any of this. What do they do? Mainly they gamble. Bail me out because I'm too big to fail. The story of bankers and politicians is as old as money in politics. Politicians are funded by the banks, and banks are bailed out by the politicians. We really have a kind of a duopoly here. The bankers and the politicians have formed this uh, partnership. See, in order to create money out of nothing, which the Fed does, they need an act of Congress to authorize it, okay? So that's where their buddies in Congress say, okay, we vote another trillion dollars to help the poor people of this country because we want them to have jobs. We want to give them work. So we'll create a big employment machine and we're going to create jobs. And so we'll create another trillion dollars. And, but nobody asks, well, where does the money come from? Well, the politicians raise their hand. They vote for the money. They don't have the money, of course, but they vote for a trillion dollars because we're going to do jobs for people. And so they get elected, they're, they're big heroes, right? But they don't realize that then the Federal Reserve says, okay, Congress has just demanded another trillion dollars, it doesn't have it, so we will create this trillion dollars because that's our part of the partnership. And we will give it to the government to spend on jobs. And where does the money come from? Well, that's a big mystery, isn't it? It comes out of thin air, which means it floods into the economy and it pushes down the purchasing power of all the other dollars that are already out there, which means inflation. That's where it comes from. So all of the people who are supposedly being benefit, benefited by jobs or whatever it is are paying for this thing out of one pocket. They put you know, $10 out of this pocket and they get $1.50 back here and they think, oh, we've been saved by our great politicians and our bankers. The biggest pools of um, finance for politicians to fund their campaigns, their massive campaigns. You know, Obama reportedly um, had a two billion dollar marketing campaign. The largest source of that finance comes from the creators of money, which is the financial and banking sector. The banks bankrupted themselves with the derivatives bubble. All bubbles burst. They should have known that. They don't want to know. They do it anyway, like heroin addicts, right? They know it's bad, but they're going to do it anyway. Uh, when that bubble burst, the banks then turned to the governments and said, bail us out, bail us out, bail us out. And their political power and their ability to buy politicians is so great that the governments then began bankrupting themselves in order to save the zombie banks, right? The U.S. Treasury, not the Federal Reserve, but the Treasury, the tax money, given about a trillion dollars to the various Wall Street uh, zombie banks. Quantitative easing, that's the technical buzzword for printing more and more money. We've had QE1, QE2, and now QE3 to the tune of $40 billion 
a month. QE3 was basically a program for the Federal Reserve to give money to the banks until Beethoven writes his 10th symphony. Q123, all it is, all it is, is sinking the United States of America further into debt. The only people it does any good is the, the traders on Wall Street, same banks, because they can take that zero interest money that they're being given and they can put it into, guess what, oil futures and, you know, corn futures. And you wonder why you're paying more at the store and you wonder why you're paying more at the gas station. We've reached a point in, in world history that we've never reached before. We've reached debt saturation. Uh, and what that means is that uh, further quantitative easing, in other words, just merely dumping hot money uh, into the top of the system instead of the bottom, into the top, the financial sector, uh, is now no longer producing an increase in GDP. Uh, the cover story of the giveaway to the banks is that if uh, the Federal Reserve makes loans to the banks, unlimited amounts, uh, more than $800 billion for QE2, the banks will have enough money that they can afford to lend more uh, uh, mortgage money, to bid up real estate prices, to try to reinflate the bubble, and that they can lend to small businesses. The reality is that ever since QE1 and QE2, every time there's a loan, the banks reduce their loans to businesses, they reduce their mortgage loans, there's less mortgage refinancing, and in fact, the banks use the money to gamble. These bank bailouts, I think that they were, you know, they were possibly diversionary tactics because when 800 billions of, you know, 800 billion dollars was uh, ordered to be, you know, given, given out to the banks, when uh, uh, when they were allegedly about to fail, um, there was there was about fifteen trillion dollars, you know, given out to who knows where by the Federal Reserve Bank at the same time. So and then we also know that there were hundreds of trillions of dollars that were created out of thin air and then just kind of written off the books. So it seems to me it's just all fake. The bailout was far bigger than the Federal Reserve let the public or even members of Congress know at the time. In fact, from the start of the financial crisis in 2007 through March of 2009, the Fed loaned or guaranteed the banks some $7.7 .7 trillion, about half the value of all the goods and services produced by the U.S. economy. That's 11 times the $700 billion in aid provided by the Treasury Department's better-known Trouble Asset Relief Program, or TARP. On just one day, December 5, 2008, America's banks borrowed $1.2 trillion from the Fed. Furthermore, says Bloomberg, the banks borrowed that money from the Fed at as little as one hundredth of one percent interest. As a result, the banks were spared the need of selling off assets that paid much higher rates of interest. Bloomberg estimates the banks made a $13 billion profit on the spread, on money they borrowed virtually free from the Fed. So the taxpayers were told they had no option but to bail out the very same sick institutions, too big to fail, that it failed them, America, and for that matter, the world. Trillions of dollars went out of the taxpayers' pockets. Trillions more went out of the Fed, God knows from where. But where did the bailout money actually go? A QE2 was $800 billion, and all of QE2 was used by the banks to speculate on foreign currencies and interest rate arbitrage. Most was used to the, uh, lent to the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, you could, the banks borrowed at one quarter of 1% and lent money to Brazil at 11% uh, and pocketed the interest rate arbitrage. All this 800 billion, so much went out that it pushed up the value of Brazil's uh, Cruzeiro, so the banks made a foreign exchange profit on top of the interest rate arbitrage. None of this money went into the U.S. economy. The banking sector is doing a very poor job of actually taking that bailout money and redistributing it to where it's actually going to make a difference in the world, which is productive use, investment in infrastructure, investment in businesses that can create jobs, non-inflationary investment. The challenge is, is that that money is just going straight into bankers' bonuses, into sustaining banks' um, ability to lend to property and to lend to consumers. But exactly how bankrupt are the US banks? If you look at the, the U.S. banks in particular, right, uh, Bank of America and uh, 
J.P. Morgan Chase, which is the heart of the system, and um, Citibank and a couple of others. W what is their current status? They should be put through Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Those are bankrupt entities. They were bankrupt in 2008. Without those cash infusions and the cheap credit, they would have been long gone. But they're politically powerful enough and their campaign contributions are big enough so that uh, they resist that. They're not put through bankruptcy. And now the multi-trillion dollar question. If the banks are bankrupt, how could the bankers and the banking system for that matter get bigger, richer and fatter by the day? We're getting like this triple effect. One, they have the ability to create money. Secondly, they get bailed out by the banks. And thirdly, they cream interest off unsustainable lending, um, which is causing you know, a, a triple enrichment of the banking sector, even though they're completely technically insolvent as well. Banksters at large, to this day, not a single major banker has been brought to justice. Well, the reason that we haven't had a single major player in the banking system prosecuted at the moment is simply because the banks are operating within the rules and framework by which they're allowed to operate. And, you know, some of the scandals that we're seeing is where they're loopholing the rules, they're loopholing what they're allowed to do. Um, but the, the, the reality is that they're simply doing what works within the existing laws and framework within the Bank Charter Acts, within all of the rules that have been set up for banks. So when it comes to prosecution, um, it's a very challenging subject because um, the, you know, the, you've got these two things. You've got the people that work in the, 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 the government, um, which are actually part of the banking system. And secondly, really, the, the government's allowing um, the rules to be played in this way. Regardless of whatever is written in code, the Federal Reserve really has no oversight. And they are not really bound by a checks and balance system like the three branches of our government. Congress, although not by law, essentially has given up all its oversight responsibilities over the Fed. There are no true audits. Congress knows nothing of the conversations, the plans, and the action taken in concert with other central banks. We get less and less information regarding the money supply each year, especially now that we, uh, aren't, we don't even have access to M M3 statistics. The role the Fed uh, plays in the President's secretive working group on financial markets goes uh, essentially unnoticed by Congress. The Federal Reserve shows no willingness to inform Congress voluntarily about how often the working group meets, what action it takes that affects the financial markets or, or why it takes these actions. In front of a session of Congress, uh, the President and Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank have stated to, to members of Congress that, that they're not even going to tell them how many trillions of dollars were lent out during a short period of time. They're not going to tell them where the money went, what the interest was on the loan, or if it was a loan, what the collateral was on these multi-trillions of dollars. The people who are running the central banking cartel in the United States, known as the Federal Reserve Bank, are guilty of treason. So without audits, it's impossible to know how much the Federal Reserve is actually printing, who they are loaning it to, and any potential conflicts of interest. Henry Ford said about the Federal Reserve, it is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. Thank you for watching. Always follow the money trail with me, Amir Arfa.